<laughs> Woo! What's cracking, big dogs? Welcome, bike to the headquarters. Welcome, bike to the channel. This is Bunk Bed Breakdowns, which is Big Dogs' exclusive dynasty show. Every single Wednesday, us three are chopping it up. Sometimes I fail to show up like a bad parent, a bad father that went to the grocery store and never came back. These are my sons, but I am here this week and we got a good episode for y'all. They have a ton of exclusive dynasty content on their channel. If you guys want more of whatever we're talking about today, they're putting out, they're putting a lot of work in over there. So make sure you subscribe to the bunk bed breakdowns, YouTube channel, as well as listening via podcast. That's where you get the audio for these shows today. Uh, we have revamped our dynasty rankings. We redid everything, taking into effect anything that's happened over the last couple of weeks, reports, rumors, player transactions, et cetera. And we looked at the top 100 rankings we have for Dynasty right now and looked at uh, the biggest kind of discrepancies between the three of us. And we wanted to discuss, kind of have a little bit of an argument of, you know, why this guy's ranked outside of the top 100 when the other two have him inside the top 70, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Below me is Michael. To the left of me is a literal fucking tomato. Uh, I believe he, <laughs> believe he used to go by the name Noah or at FB God on Twitter. Uh, good to be good to be bike boys. Missed uh, last week, I believe, but um, but that was the best episode ever. Yeah, and all the fucking episodes <laughs> without me are the best episodes ever. I don't know why you guys still invite me onto the show. Take your iTunes iTunes review. Every episode I'm not on is very good. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, he that guy wasn't lying. <laughs> all right i'm ready to roll y'all ready to roll yes yeah, good. Sir. you know what to do hit that intro all right so you know as we said we always like to audit our own work and this week we're auditing our ranks uh, you know, we did a couple episode a couple of weeks ago where we basically asked Noah which one of his aunts all the players he had fornication with. Um, this week, we're going to may pose those same questions to each other. Um, I think first up is going to be our boy. And when I say our, I mean uh, Noah and mine because Nick obviously completely disrespects him for no goddamn reason. But it's Gardner, a.k.a. Goatner Minshew. Nick has him all the way at 107 in Superflex. Noah's got him at 72. I'm in the middle at 78 for a composite BDG ranking of 83. Um, we got him at basically QB 24. Nick's got him all the way down at QB 28, which means that there are 27 other quarterbacks Nick would rather have. I don't even know if I can name 27 quarterbacks in the NFL. I know there's 32 teams, but some of them just don't matter. Uh, so I think I'm going to pass the mic off to Nick real quick for him to defend this atrocious ranking of Gardner Minshew. Listen, there, I, I am as high on Gardner in redraft leagues as possibly anyone can be, but what confidence level do you have that he's going to be here next year? That's the concern. It's like he's one of those guys where he could be awesome for fantasy this year and not mm -hmm. be a starting quarterback in the NFL by next year, and I almost feel like that's most likely – outcome it's the most likely mm -hmm. scenario for where they are because the Jaguars are going to be a terrible team this year there's mm -hmm. no doubt in my mind they're not surpassing five wins and when you're a team with that type of win-loss record you end up being in the quarterback spot for draft capital you end up being in the top five next year we're going to have a few quarterbacks that are going within that range and if they're looking to build uh, a team around somebody I mean maybe it's Minshew they did make a lot of moves obviously that suggests that they're going to give Minshew the full fucking flight this year in 2020 and let him let him see what he has to do and he was great throwing the ball deep the accuracy was there his arm strength in particular is not like an actual strength of his but the accuracy was there uh, on the ground he was surprising and that's why we like him for fantasy and that's why I like him for redraft this year but it seems like for me the way I'm looking at him is like you're going to catch lightning in a bottle with him in 2020 and then Jaguars are going to be a terrible team and look to build around someone else after that. So it's an investment that I look at as like a one year kind of rental. And at that point, it's like, uh, I don't know, there are other guys I would rather have because I'm definitely concerned about the long term prospect of Minshew. Right. I mean, I got as much confidence in Gardner Minshew as actually no, arguably more confidence in Gardner Minshew than I do in Drew Locke holding his job past next year. And Drew Locke is currently going as what, like a top, top 15 quarterback? Yeah. Yeah, top four, top fifteen quarterback. You got him at quarterback twenty, so that's uh, eight spots higher than him. You got Tom Brady higher than him, and look, I'm a Patriots fan. Tom Brady's a goat. The guy's a god. 
but like how much longevity does he have? You know, he's already 41. We have no idea. And like, the thing is like, look, even if Minshew loses his job here, like there's a chance he picks up a job somewhere else. I think that's also a possibility. Yeah. But the main thing is just like, like at that, at like who like outside of the top, I don't know, 12, 12 quarterbacks, maybe even maybe 15 quarterbacks. Like, who do you really have like that much confidence in long term, right? I feel like in the low. Justin Herbert. <laughs> yeah, I feel like in the low QB twos, it's kind of like uh, I'm fine with getting that one year of production, and you know his price reflects like that's basically what you're going to get, right? Most of the players you draft in that range, you're not going to get a full years of production out of them. So that's kind of how I approach the problem. I'm I'm confident that Brady's going to like if I were to say who's going to have more starts over the next two years in the NFL, I would go with Brady and. Like I said, with the team thing, that's what concerns me more is that there you have all those quarterback twos who, yeah, might even be less talented than Gardner Minshew and might be worse in fantasy this year than Minshew. But when we look at it from an NFL perspective, the majority of those guys aren't going to have competition at the NFL level. The majority of those guys aren't going to be on a team where, you know, if you're picking a quarterback outside of like the top five or six picks in the NFL draft, it's very, very unlikely that they actually hit and become like the franchise for your you know the the guy for your franchise for the most part Mm -hmm. so I think like them the Jacksonville Jaguars being a team that's going to be picking really early on in the draft are very likely to target a quarterback there whereas most teams you know aren't going to be yeah I'm pretty high on Minshew and there's a lot of concern of him being replaced last year but as Nick said also like they built a lot around him their offensive line still sucks Leonard Fournette is still garbage but like they bring in LaVisca Chenault they have DJ Chark there. They bring Chris Thompson for whatever the hell he can bring to the table. Like, they built this offense to try to give Gardner Minshew, like, a full arsenal of weapons to see what he can do. And, he, like, if they're a top two or three pick next year, they're definitely going to go for a quarterback. But, like, I, I don't think that if he loses his job next year, the rest of his career, he's just done. I think, as, as Mike was saying, like, a Drew Brees or uh, a Drew Locke and maybe even a Jimmy Garoppolo who has, like, an out on his deal after this year, I think Gardner Minshew has much more longevity than those guys because – He was kind of thrown into a terrible situation this year. Like, he was not expected to start at at all uh, after how much they paid Nick Foles in, like, an early injury during the season. So I think he showed enough in his rookie season to get another contract elsewhere. And because of that, we'll have longevity in other areas. And because of his rushing upside and what he showed with his arm, I think wherever he goes, he'll be an asset for you in fantasy. So I think Mike and I both have him. He has him quarterback 22. I have him quarterback 20 that definitely bakes in the risk because if I expected him to have the job next year, I probably have him like around my top 15 and that sounds bold. But what you got to realize is like week in and week out last season, he was a solid, like high end QB two for you. And in super flex leagues, if you're getting at the, the 20th overall position uh, off the board, that's like a really good value. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I think, you know, it, it's fair to have definitely the concern risk as well, but you know, to me, I feel like that risk is baked in, uh, you know, to you, maybe it seems like it's not. So that's probably the, the delta there. Uh, next up, though, we've got another guy, another rushing quarterback, uh, someone who gets a lot of hate. I was actually surprised to see, like, Nick, is, you're lower than, than both of us on this, but because uh, I thought I was low on Josh Allen. Um, but Josh Allen, uh, Nick's got him at 46. Noah's got him at 31. I got him at 34 for a composite of 38 overall. Uh, Noah's got him at QB9, so a little bit higher. He's in the top 10 for you. He's in uh, QB11 for me, and Nick's at QB12. So composite score of QB11. So, Nick, you and I actually aren't too far off in terms of positional rankings, but obviously, you know, you're a little bit lower on him uh, from an overall perspective. Um, you know, we talk about drop security for Gardner Minshew. I think, honestly, I think the same applies to, like, Josh Allen. Like, there's just, like, there's only, like, eight or nine guys that I feel, like, confident they're going to be starters for, for at least the next four to five years. And, you know, as high as we have Josh Allen, like, ranked and as high as he's been getting drafted, what I found in my experience is, like, trying to trade him at that value is next to impossible because I think people are pretty sharp and they're on to the fact that, like, look, he's he's not a great passer. And, like, his career arc right now is, like, you know, more similar to Blake Bortles than it is to anyone else. So, and we all saw what happened with Blake Bortles. If you don't actually progress as a passer in the NFL, um, unless you're, like – a world-class like rusher like cam like you're just not really gonna make it long term um but you know you obviously have him a little bit lower noah like you have him the highest so like what's uh, what's giving you hope there on josh allen yeah basically everything aside for the longevity argument gives me hope because like week in and week out last season if you're thinking just straight redraft and for this season also like i don't see him being outside like the top six or seven quarterbacks on a week-to-week basis and for a season-long basis because he does give you that rushing upside he takes a ton of goal line carries 
he throws the ball deep. He's probably going to convert like one of eight of them every week, but that's good enough for some fantasy production. He's just extremely, extremely solid. I put out a tweet today uh, over his last 21 games where he played over 99% of the snaps, so basically a full snap share. There's only three times he put up less than 18 fantasy points. So he's an extremely uh, valuable floor play, but he also gives you the ceiling because of his legs. The thing about him, Mike, that you said, like he hasn't really progressed a lot. I agree with that, but it's also a second year in the league, and he the team in the AFC East playoffs did all right, and then he tried to like lateral the ball to Dawson Knox, which basically shows his IQ on the football field. But if we were saying like you're getting him for the next three years or however long he's under contract, and your argument that a lot of guys don't have much longevity in the league over the next three to four years, I think of those guys, he'd probably be a top-end option. So if you're going to have no confidence in any of them, I think Josh Allen, at least if he's going to play out his rookie deal in Buffalo, is going to be an elite option for the for the time that he's there. Yeah, I mean, it seems like they're they're certainly um, building the team around him. So it seems like he's got uh, a longer leash than a guy like Minshew or whatever, because they seem like they just have no idea what the fuck they're doing. They're just adding random pieces to the roster and the personnel or whatever. Josh Allen, it just comes back to the to the accuracy. He's just not accurate on any part of the field. And for the most part, that tends to play itself out over the long run. I mean, he was, like, wildly consistent last year. I think there was, like – I mean, you, you kind of threw out the stat with the 99%. But I remember looking at this, like, very very early on in the offseason, there was, like, two games that he went under 16 fantasy points last year. And it was against, I think, like, Baltimore and New England or something like that. Like, two really, really stiff defenses. And it's weird because you don't really know what you're getting from him because his rookie year – uh, his first year as a starter there, you were getting like wildly inconsistent games, right? And then the end of the year is when he blew up. So he was like six points, four points, 11 points, and then like 26 points. And then last year, he wasn't too much of like that boom bust player. He was just like a consistently good floor play. Uh, them adding Zach Moss, I feel like they're a very run heavy team. Like they're going to want to go run heavy. I don't know what the volume is going to look like in terms of passing for Josh Allen I don't know if we even really need to think about that uh, but they do bring in Stefan Diggs so like hopefully they can connect more on the long balls there I just I don't know like Josh Allen's I mean he's the quarterback 12 for me so I'm still drafting him as a quarterback one I just think the overall rankings the reason he's dropping down is because if I'm unsure about a quarterback at that price like rather than a third round quarterback I'm unsure of I'd rather just take a skill player like where you can get a DeAndre Swift who I'm very confident in like one or two years down the road is going to be like an elite option at their price and that's where you're getting all those like wide receivers like you're seeing like the Juju's and the AJ Browns and shit like that fall there so if I'm like I'd much rather have that guy you know who I know is going to be in my lineup for a long time than a guy like Josh Allen who brings some excitement but like I think you're always hesitant to pull the trigger on a guy like that. And if I find myself in that predicament where I don't feel confident doing it, I might as well kind of pivot away. And that's where I kept like seeing him. It was just like, Oh, this guy, I'd like that guy a little bit more. And before I know it, it was like 10 spots further down the, the rankings, you know? Yeah. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I mean, it kind of brings into question. We'll wrap it up with the next quarterback at the end, but I just feel like the quarterback position, like the whole longevity argument is getting um, a little bit outdated. Right. Cause like the, people are teams are not giving like quarterbacks as long of a leash as they used to because there's there's like constantly like influx of new talent coming from college like we know next year is going to be trevor lawrence it's going to be um justin fields probably going to be trey lance and someone else we don't even know of yet in 2022 it's going to be like sam howell it's going to be like get on slovis like another guy i probably don't even know about so it's just like there's so much influx of talent similar to how there's influx of talent at running backs quarterbacks longevity is getting like longer in the game because they can play for longer so the the supply side is going to be kind of like meeting the demand side a lot more than before and you kind of saw it with like cam and Jameis. like i feel like in years past these guys would have got swept off free agency like pretty quickly but they're both playing on like minimum wage contracts um in the nfl so it, it kind of rolls right in, into the next one though um and it's sam darnold nick you actually have him only two spots behind uh, josh allen so sounds like you probably have him in the similar tier uh, Noah's got him at 64. I got him at 59 for a composite of 57. Um, and then you got him at QB 14. Noah's at QB 18. I'm at QB 17. Uh, so, you know, it seems like you're you're either, I guess, a lot lower on Josh Allen or you're just like a lot higher on Sam Darnold and I guess his like his his longevity. And like, do you think you, you basically, I, I would assume you're, you're foreseeing that he outlasts case, right? That's got to be where. A hundred percent. I think the Jets are like fully invested into Donald and it might be to their detriment. Like we might get to a point where they're so, uh, you guys still with me? Oh, sorry. Kind of broke up there yeah. for a sec. Uh, we might get to the point where it's like so many years into Donald's career and we're still kind of unsure about him. 
But like, here's what's going to happen. It's like, they're going to have another shitty year this year. Darnold might take a step up in real life, but he's not going to be statistically that great for your fantasy team. They're going to, they're going to blame it on Gase. They're going to get rid of Gase. They're going to bring in a new head coach. They're going to ride it out with Sam Darnold. That year might go slow, but they're going to blame that on first year head coach. Oh, let's get the second year. I just, I just see this elongated out for like another five or six years. And Darnold is so young that by the time that eventually plays out and he's got experience with these coaches and the players on his team or whatever, he's going to be like in the prime of his career finally. Like this is a pick that I'm, I'm investing a lot into the future because Darnold, I'm like pretty sure he's almost going to be unusable this year in fantasy. And that might be the same next year. But if they end up getting like Eric Benimi from the Chiefs or something and they implement a really good offensive system there in New York and they finally develop some of these younger weapons like the Denzel Mims and Chris Herndons and whatever, like it could be a good offense in a couple of years. They're starting to develop the offensive line. They're getting young pieces. So I'm in on Darnold. The other thing to say about these quarterbacks too is why I stopped getting like too high on these middle round guys is because, you know, year in and year out, the points per game differential between the quarterback eight and the quarterback 15, 18 is really small. So I don't really fret when it comes to the quality of the mid round quarterbacks. Like if you miss out on the elite ones, I'm fine going quantity over quality. So that's mm-hmm. also why I wouldn't have Josh Allen all the way up at like 30 or 35. Cause I'd much rather have the skill position players there, but yeah, for Darnold, it comes down to the fact that he's just so unbelievably young still. And I, I think that New York is complete. This is the first time they've had like a real franchise quarterback that you can feel that they're actually building around this guy rather than just like plug and play guys who they drafted later or like veterans or some shit. So I think they're going to do all they can to continue to try to build around Darnold, but uh, admittedly definitely like a probably kind of fading the 2020 uh, version of Darnold. Yeah, well, Rex Ryan actually had a tattoo of his wife and a Mark Sanchez jersey on his arm, so he showed a little commitment there, even though that guy's fucking stunk. Uh, with Sam Darnold, though, I agree with you, Nick. I think in like three to four years, he's going to be really good because, as you said, he, he's very young. He's like the Jason Tatum of the NFL. Like He'll never be older than 19 until he hits 30. Uh, the thing is why I have him at 64, my quarterback 18, is because I do expect a down year this year. And as you were saying, if they bring in a new OC or head coach in 2021 and he struggles again, I can only see his value falling because at that point when he's like 24, 25 years old, if that's how old he'll be in two years, um, I think people are going to start to be like, well, is he even going to play out his rookie deal and pick up the fifth year option, all that type of stuff. So I think if you were to draft like a Matt Stafford and he has like a typical Matt Stafford year this season and Sam Darnold does what he's been doing in the past, which is extremely boom bust. I think you'd be able to flip a Stafford for a Sam Darnold, despite the age disparity and be able to knock off a few years off of his, like not in his prime where he's not producing. So I'm a little bit lower just because I think the return on investment that you would get for him isn't really worth investing like a fourth round pick in him instead of just like drafting a Ryan Tanhill or Matthew Stafford or somebody like that. And then flipping him one to two years down the road when he's finally like getting a grasp of the offense that he's in, because with Adam Gase, I just don't see things changing right now. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. A definitely. Just, receiver. He's, he's going to have value for so long. That's the thing with Darnold, man. It, it's just like, even if he doesn't play well, there are just, you can already see all the excuses lined up for all the people that want to buy him. So it's like, even if, you know, I don't even like him that much as a player, like there will always be people in your dynasty league that will like him. So I'm not drafting him that high to be like, yeah, he's such good trade value, but I do believe he'll, he'll get to a point where he's actually a good fantasy quarterback for you. Yeah. For sure. Um, so next up, we got BDG home favorite, Derek Henry, the king. Um, so Mike's like fucking see. sees that contract go through. He's like, trade that shit. <laughs> Sur- surprised <laughs> to see. I'll let you guys go first. I mean, you you got him at 25. Nick, no, you got him at 21. Surprised to see that. Uh, I got him at 44, composite 29 overall. Uh, you guys both got him at RB12. So back end of that RB1, I've got him at the top part of the RB2 range at number 16 overall. Uh, so overall, we got him as a fringe RB1, so I don't think it's too disrespectful. But, you know, why are you guys so high on Derrick Henry? No, I'll let you talk about your boy first, your baby boy. I can't boy. believe it. I, I never thought I'd see the day where I was, like, the highest to rank a Derrick Henry among more than, like, two people in a group. But here we are. He's my 21st player off the board. And I'm honestly disgusted looking at it. Like, I can't believe LT's number is stamped next to Derrick Henry's name. It's, like, it's real sickening. But the fact that he's signed for four more years – Shows me, shows me that they're, like, somewhat committed to him. I know in the offseason, like, Chris Johnson was on some podcast, and he was talking about how they didn't extend him, and they thought that was because, like, early in his career, he was, like, not motivated because he was behind DeMarco Murray, and he thought he should have the job, yada, yada, yada. So I was kind of nervous that he wasn't going to give – they weren't going to give him a long leash and a long deal. The four-year deal, it's nice. He's probably not going to be elite for all four of them, but even if he's what he was last year for the next one or two seasons – 
you're getting a top five running back over the next two years. And I mean, this is a pretty high investment. Like I really don't care about three years down the line because if you are drafting Derrick Henry, you're not a rebuilding team. You know that you're playing for win now or if you're trading for him. So I think a fair value for him is somewhere in that second or third round because, you know, if you're win now and you can get a top five, top six running back for the next two seasons, that's kind of invaluable to your team because we know he's going to get 300 plus carries. He's not going to catch any passes. He'll maybe bring like a 75 yard reception to the house, but like there's, there's no competition for him there. Uh, they have a defense that allows them to chew clock and just feed him week in and week out. And that whole offense is just like built around the run game. So I don't see how they kind of shy away from using Derrick Henry. And even if he does break down when he's like 28 or 29 years old, you get two really good years out of him. Yeah. But the way I, I look at Derrick Henry is like, we talk a lot about on this podcast, those like mid tier running backs who are a little bit older in age, like around where Derrick Henry is like 26. We talk about how drafting them usually is a trap move, right? And it gets you into a bad spot early. The reason I say that is like 26 or 27 is not out of the age range of where your talent starts to dip off. There are plenty of backs that are still talented enough to handle work, you know, workloads that are RB1 type workloads. Most of the guys that are that age, I'm telling you to fade are like, you know, I don't think David Johnson is good anymore. I think Le'Veon Bell could be very good in a good situation, but he's going to be with the Jets for the next year or so. And that makes him an auto fade because by the time he's done, then he is out of that age range. But the reason I, I don't like taking like even like an Aaron Jones right now right like he's still young and he's really good but the problem is like when you're about to be on that contract year going into your second contract we don't know what that what that's going to entail right we don't know if you're going to get the contract that means okay you have a really solid role in our team we don't know where you're going to end up so when you have like Derrick Henry signing the four-year deal at 26 years old I'm not worried about him not him being too old or him not having the talent anymore like we we know now right like we don't have to worry about oh where is he going to sign oh is his contract going to be the money that entails him being a workhorse in the team that he's on so with Derrick Henry like this ranking just secured the fact that this team is going to operate solely around Derrick Henry for the next two to three years. So I think he's a plug and play RB one for the next that, that long two to three years. And uh, I don't know if we'll ever get anything in the passing game, but if for, for whatever reason, these are 16 game seasons, you, weird shit happens. If for one of those years, the passing game spikes, you're going to get a guy who's popping off for 2000 yards from scrimmage probably. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, look, you guys make some good points. And for me, like, it, it looks like I hate Derrick Henry, but it just comes down to philosophy of like how I draft. So it just comes down to my drafting philosophy. I don't draft declining assets that are just like guaranteed to fall in price within the for, within the top two or three rounds. And that's exactly what Derrick Henry is. Um, but like, like what, it, what says what says his value declines soon? Like his value might stay where it is for the next two or three years his value is going to decline and then there's going to be younger running backs to come in other people are going to push him for like push him into that range so that's like uh, that's just like how it plays out like every time um like and especially for someone like him where he doesn't have involvement in the passing game um it's just like it's really tough to like hold that value i think so uh, you know maybe it's not guaranteed there's in decline but i i bet like 90 like nine to one like 10 to one odds that his value declines by this time next year um just based on like the psyche of how people think but also, like, you know, you've said he's like a top five running back, or he could be. And maybe, maybe he certainly could be. Um, I just I just don't really see it at all in terms of, like, likelihood because, because of what happened this year, right? Like, literally all the stars lined for him. Rushing title, like, insane amount of rushing touchdowns, not just for him, but just for the team total. Just, like, the way they convert in the red zone. It just, like, historically low passing volumes. Just, like, everything had to work out. And he was still a, like, what, RB5, I think it was, or RB4? Or before uh, five, depending on I what think, scoring you're doing. Yeah, I, I think like half PBR, he was two or three, maybe behind Aaron Jones and C Mac. Uh, uh, yeah, I think it was three. Was he three in half PBR? I half think so because Dalvin Cook was up there, but then he got hurt towards the half end. Half PBR, yeah, sorry, sorry. I'm yeah. talking about, yeah, sorry, I'm talking about points per game. So it was like, I think it was points like, per, what? Not points per game. He was actually Eichler. two. He was higher. Really? Yeah, that's he was tied with Dalvin Cook because Derek Henry only played 15. Uh, that's true. I guess half PBR is a little bit different. He's out that week 17, the 5,000 yards rushing. Okay. Yeah, I'm probably thinking about full PPR then. But yeah, it's just like it feels like everything has to align right for that to happen. And then also, like I feel like this is a weird year too, right? Because you got Kamara who went down to injury, Barkley went down to injury. This would be a lot of stuff that challenges him at the top. And like I would just much rather, I'd much rather bet on a younger guy, like younger guy, like a younger running back. As much as we think rookies are risky, I think young running backs with high draft capital is actually not that risky of a bet. So it's not that I hate Derrick Henry per se. It's that I just like, I try to target like certain 
certain things in that range. And like when I'm drafting in that range, I love to keep my drafts more flexible. And like you kind of said it, like, but the second you draft a Derrick Henry or like a Travis Kelsey or or things like that, like you're basically committed to going all in your one and it's just like not really high draft. So that's kind of like what my rankings reflect. It's not that I think he sucks. It's just that like that's how I that's how like that compose of my I compose like my rosters and go into a draft. Yeah, I'm I mean, just trying to stay off the Derrick Henry hater compilation that Nick was making from last year. So anything that keeps me off that video, I'm just I'm gonna ride that wave. <laughs> nah, we won't put that up. Don't worry. That would okay, that would be the downfall of the brand real quick. <laughs> yeah, like I get I get what you're saying with Derrick Henry. Though. I, I feel like most of the running backs that we look at are probably in that um, fall into that category where like it's more of like a systematic approach to drafting, and I would fade. But I feel like he's in a different situation for me. And I, you know, I touched on like Aaron Jones. He's the next guy on this list here. I have him ranked all the way at 60 overall. Um, I actually don't have him much further behind you guys in terms of running back rankings at 18, but Noah, you have him at 39. Mike, you have him at 49 uh, running back 18, running back 15 for Noah, running back 17 for Mike with Aaron Jones. It's like, you want to talk about like the perfect things happening in an offense last year. Like that was, that was Aaron Jones fucking exponentially. So I, I see Aaron Jones as someone who is young, but he's not – I mean, he's about to be off his rookie contract. He's not that much younger than, Der, uh, than Derrick Henry is, and we have no idea where Aaron Jones is going to end up next year. Does he get an extension with Green Bay? I mean, that could be good, but it also might not be because A.J. Dillon could take a bigger role next year or his third year, you know? Um, yes, it's exciting. Like, fantasy players tend to look at best-case scenario always. That's why everyone likes betting the over because it's exciting. You think all these great things are going to happen. That's why Vegas usually wins because the yep. under, the things that are less exciting end up. Well, I always win. Yeah, exactly. That's why Mike's the finance, the only uh, literate finance person on our fucking team. But Aaron <laughs> Jones is like, it's like, okay, Aaron Jones is going to be the starting running back for San Francisco next year. Aaron Jones is going to be starting running back for uh, Atlanta next year. Like, what happens if Aaron Jones doesn't sign with one of those teams that looks at him as a workhorse? What happens yep. if someone signs him as, like, a, a, a 1B to whoever's 1A, you know? And that's kind of my – like, what, if, what happens if, like, Pittsburgh signs him next year and then he's just in a fucking muddled backfield with seven other guys that can do the same shit that he can? Yeah. Obviously, he's a great talent, but, like, Aaron Jones is a key example of where I'm, like, I, I almost see no – no way in which his value goes up. There's like a maybe like a five percent like dart throw chance that it happens. So I'm just like I'd rather just not use the draft pick on uh, on Aaron Jones unless he falls tremendously. Yeah, I mean he's definitely like one of the riskier ones. What I will say is like Aaron Jones has a. If you look at like I, I looked at the regression analysis for like Derrick Henry and Aaron Jones, how they convert in the red zone. Like Aaron Jones is literally unstoppable. He's like, the best goal line. He's the best goal line rusher in the fucking NFL. The best. That's impossible. He's not six foot two, two fifty. <laughs> he is the best rusher within five yards in the NFL. And like Henry, like you'd think he's like really good, which he is. But like last year, he was like way outperforming what his historical average is. So like, so from a TD regression standpoint, I would expect both of them to regress. To be honest with you, um, but I think Henry will get hit a little bit harder. But to your point, like there are a lot of question marks for for Aaron Jones. So I have moved him down a bit. And like as much as I hate Asia Dillon. Uh, like we can't always bet on rational coaching. So yeah. I, I have no comfort in the fact that it's going to be fourth and short or third and short. And they're going to march AJ Dillon out there. And like Aaron Jones is obviously still an incredible talent. And like, like you said, we don't know. I think it still is because they seem pretty committed to the run. Um, but again, that's also uh, coming from game script and, and flow of flow. Like we know that green Bay is one of the luckiest teams last year to have the record that they had. Um, but yeah, you bring up some good questions. I mean, you got him the highest. Like, what, what, what makes you comfortable taking him in the fourth round? Absolutely not. He's one of the guys that I'm, like, irrationally high on, and I, I'm willing to admit it. Like, as Nick said, there are so many question marks, whether it's his touchdown upside, the receiving work that he got, the splits with and without Devontae Adams. I don't know off the top of my head, but I remember last year, like, when Devontae Adams was off the field, that Kansas City game, he literally looked like Alvin Kamara, like a cookie-cutter version of him. Like, he was discussing that game. And then for the rest of the season, they decided to give it to Jamal Williams. I'm not even sure if, like, Dexter Williams was on the team, but they were probably still throwing to him more than Aaron Jones. He's just somebody who I think is extremely talented. And, I mean, that argument doesn't really hold up because a lot of coaches don't want to sign talented players. Like, Cam Newton waited this long in the offseason to get a job. I just think if he does stay in Green Bay, that probably means that they're not going to bring back Jamal Williams, which – could help his receiving upside like I don't I don't understand how a team could keep Aaron Jones out of the passing game especially because like the common narrative was he couldn't pass block but I think Mikey brought it up in a previous episode like he was eighth among all running backs and like pass block and grade so he took strides in that department he was obviously very good when they were throwing to him out of the backfield last season 
Keenan Dillon doesn't bring to the table and Aaron Jones is still a better goal line back than him. I think if, if best case scenario happens, obviously that's not smart, but if best case scenario, uh, Aaron Jones like gets a job in Green Bay and he stays there for the long term, like he can be an RB1 for the foreseeable future. I'm not really baking in the downside because as I said, like I'm completely irrational on this. I just believe in his talent way too heavily. So I, I will see this point to you guys like 39, don't draft him that high. I'm just saying like, if it does happen, I'm going to be the opposite side of my Derrick Henry takes in the past. <laughs> All right. Awesome. Yeah, uh, next Jones, up. So, yeah. Oh, you, you, uh, no, I was just going to say, it's just like, um, it, Kareem Hunt is the next guy on the list. And he's like, uh, it's kind of what I was saying about Jones where, uh, I'm only looking at like best case scenario or people are only looking at best case scenario with Jones. Like, Oh, he's going to go to San Fran or Atlanta. I'm looking at our rankings with Kareem Hunt. I have him 56. Noah has him 61. Mike has him much more conservatively down at 89. Uh, somehow we have – oh, no, I'm looking at the next guy after him. Kareem Hunt. Okay, I have Kareem Hunt as RB17. Noah is 19. Uh, Mike at 24. And this is almost like that same thing in the sense that I'm so invested into Kareem Hunt's talent that I'm projecting him to be the workhorse somewhere else next year. And I guess I'm catching myself in that fall. <laughs> but I do feel like uh, Kareem Hunt, where you have to pick him compared to an Aaron Jones, will give you I – I wouldn't be surprised they ended up with somewhat similar stat lines this year. My problem is, like, I think next year when both their contracts are up, a team is much more likely to look at Kareem Hunt as a workhorse and give him RB1 money than they are with Aaron Jones. And, like, Aaron Jones has the three-down capabilities – but, like, all of his passing work basically came in the games where Devontae Adams was hurt. He had the four games that he missed. Aaron Jones caught all of his receiving touchdowns in those four games. He had the majority of his receptions, his targets, and his receiving yards in those games. So I don't know if teams are going to view Aaron Jones the way that, like, we want Aaron Jones to be used. Whereas Kareem Hunt, I feel we already saw it his rookie year. He won the fucking rushing title. Teams are going to be like, oh, this is Kareem Hunt, our workhorse. So – while, yes, I am definitely looking at the the more optimistic side of it, and it probably needs to be pulled back a little bit, I think there's a reason behind why I look at it that way. I think because NFL teams will also kind of look at him in that light. Yeah. yeah. I also uh, think I, with Kareem Hunt, like, he's shown he can produce despite being in a committee. So even if he doesn't get the lead back role, you're basically getting, like, a James White plus some rushing upside. And he wasn't used at all on the goal line last year. I think he only had one goal line carry despite Nick Chubb not being good at all on the goal line last season. So – as Nick said, like if he does get that workhorse role, which is like completely optimistic, he's going to be like a top five running back for redraft leagues. And obviously for dynasty in turn, will be like a top 12 guy because of that. He is still pretty young. He doesn't have a whole lot of wear and tear on his body because he was suspended. And speaking to what Nick said, like teams will view him as a workhorse back. As dumb as this may sound, I low-key think like coaches will be like, oh, the Chiefs drafted him. The Chiefs just won the Super Bowl. They know what they're doing. Kareem Hunt must be good. And they're just going to invest like 15 million a year in him because of that. So I do think that the chances of him becoming a workhorse next year are higher than Aaron Jones, which doesn't really like make sense based on where I rank these guys. I, that makes no sense to me. But like, uh, I think this year, Kareem Hunt, as Nick was saying, is going to be very close to Aaron Jones production-wise. I just think that the off-field issues that we've seen in the past, like even earlier this offseason, people were thinking he's going to be cut by the Browns because of that video where he's like driving drunk and the cop let him off somehow. Like, I think that's still something you have to be a little bit concerned about and why teams are maybe hesitant to sign him to a long-term deal in the future. You but, know what's going to be the I most mean, if next fucked? year rolls around and – what happened? The, the, the thing that's going to be the most fucked is when the Browns sign him to like a three-year, $21 million extension <laughs> next offseason. And then it just ruins Nick Chubb. It ruins Kareem Hunt. And we're stuck here again. And everyone's like, oh, we'll never see either of these fucking guys. When he's 30, he'll be a workhorse, maybe. Probably for Atlanta. I'd fucking sign up for that. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, they signed like, a 30-year-old this offseason. Yeah, I mean, I, I think, look, I have him at 89. Like, maybe that's a bit low, but, like, I just value him, like, similarly to, like, I think he's worth less than a first-round pick, but more than a second-round pick. That's kind of extremely relevant without an injury to Chubb. So, uh, that's that's one reason. But also, I'm always, like, very, very hesitant about, like, like the upside scenario that you talked about, Nick, about him signing somewhere else. Like, I'm hesitant to bet on stuff like that. Like, even mm -hmm. with guys like Drake, like, I was a Drake stan, like, forever. But even with him, I was, like, super cautious. Um, so I think with Kareem Hunt, it's like you're always competing with not only who's already in the league and other free agents, but you're always competing with like incoming rookies. And like incoming rookies will always be cheaper. Um, they'll always have more longevity, and like teams just view them more. Like that's like I said, this is sort of placeable position. Is there a scenario where like if he lands in San Francisco, does he become like a top twelve RB? Yeah, for sure. That scenario is in there. But I think just in the base case, I still want to try and play to win this year. And I'm not sure like. 
I'm not sure yet how involved he'll be in the game, right? Because like we saw, what we saw last year was, was under a completely different coaching regime. And what we saw in Minnesota was like Dalvin Cook got everything, right? Like he got all the workload. Obviously Cook is a better passer, uh, receiver than, than Chubb. But I don't know if like, I'm not sure yet how much split Kareem Hunt will get. So I'm not sure how much standalone value he will have. And then I'm just, yeah, it's just like, there's a lot of question marks with him. So again, like a lot of question marks on the field, a lot of question marks off the field. So that's kind of like where I have him, where he's at. And yeah, like there's just like other guys, like if, if you're talking about like the fifth 56 and 60 and like the fifth and sixth rounds, that's usually where I'm targeting wide receivers. So if you see my ranks, that's a lot of t- wide receiver heavy stuff. So I don't have too many running backs in that range. Yeah. It's going to be one of the more interesting things that happens this year in the NFL, that Brown's backfield, because almost everything people point to is just like the splits between those two last year, which we can't use because it's Kevin Stefanski coming in and it's going to be a whole new, uh, a whole new system, but the offensive line is upgraded. I'd imagine they're going to use hunt as, you know, somewhat of a, of a weapon. He probably won't get the carries anyone wants him to get or that he got his rookie year or whatever. Um, but it's going to be, it's going to be a, a fun show to watch in Cleveland for yep. sure. All right. Next up, we got Noah's boy, Melgo, Melvin Gordon. Nick's got him at 77th overall. Nick's, uh, sorry, Noah's got him the highest at 65, despite him leaving your team in the dust. And I've got him the lowest at 83 for 74 overall. Both Nick and I have him at RB22. Noah's got him at RB20 uh, for BDZ composite of RB21. It's wild how, how quickly a year changes things because Melvin Gordon was going as like a top 12 running back last year, even when he was threatening holdout. So um, I don't know what your thoughts are, but like, if I just like, again, there's a lot of question marks there between like his age, how he's going to get used. Like, I don't know if Denver is going to give him the workhorse role or if they're going to give him a committee role and split with Lindsay. To me, I think Lindsay's a much more efficient runner, to be honest. So I think he actually threatens Gordon quite a bit. Uh, not to say that I think Lindsay will have the lead back role, but I think it might be more of a split than people think. Like, I don't, I don't think Gordon comes in and just, becomes that traditional workhorse that he's always been in the LA Chargers where he got like all the touch on the goal line, like all the receiving work and everything like that. So that's my concerns with Melvin Gordon. You know what I could see this turning into? This is a weird comp, but Buffalo's backfield last year of Devin Singletary and Frank Gore, like Mike, I'm with you. And I think Lindsay is a much better runner than Melvin Gordon is at this point in his career. I could see Lindsay getting like 10 carries a game by like week six or week eight, him getting 10 to 12 carries a game. But I think Melvin gets almost all of the valuable work. Like I think they're going to yep. use him really heavily in the passing game because he's shown that he's really good in that aspect of the game. They're going to use him in the goal line. Their offensive line is going to be very underrated this year, especially from a run blocking standpoint. Uh, so I, th- I think there's going to be some good deficiency there on the ground to be had for Melvin. I also think like we could be wrong about that and they just feed Melvin 20 touches a game. Like I actually yep. think there is a ceiling for him to be like a, I don't want to say elite because I think in order to get to that elite status, you still have to have elite talent, but like knocking on the door of elite fantasy production this year, you know, like if he ended up finishing as the RB seven, because he scores, you know, he rolls his way into like 11 rushing scores or something like that. It wouldn't shock me whatsoever. So I think there's an underrated ceiling here with definitely some concerns about efficiency, but I I do think he could, he could bust out a couple uh, of good years under the contract that he got with Denver. Yeah, I do see the upside here because, as Nick was saying, the offensive line is pretty good. Last year, they were 11th in adjusted line yards. They did lose their center, who was, like, middle of the pack in terms of run blocking. But they upgraded Ronald Lear to Graham Glasgow, which, like, Ronald Lear was, like, 62 or 68. Like, he was really bad. Graham Glasgow was, like, 8th or 6th, so he was really good. And Melvin Gordon has not been efficient throughout his career. But the one year he was was 2018, and that was basically the only season he's been there where either Mike McCoy wasn't calling the plays or their offensive line wasn't terrible. They were sixth in adjusted line yards that year, and he was basically like the RB2 throughout the entire season before he got injured in that Cardinals game. Uh, I just think with an improved offensive line and the fact that he is a superior pass catcher to Philip Lindsay, and although Philip Lindsay is very good on the goal line, I don't see a scenario where Melvin Gordon gets zero goal line carries this year because they were still giving Rice Freeman the ball in that area of the field a little bit last year. That dude stinks. So I do think this year he has the upside of like a top 10 running back. And in the future, he's kind of like a Derrick Henry pick where if you choose him, you know you're not rebuilding. So if you want to win now, I think he's a decent enough like fifth, sixth round pick for your team. Maybe fifth is a little bit too early, but like a sixth or seventh round pick because people are thinking he's like completely washed up, which I don't totally agree with because I think I think like what he showed uh, two years ago was that he is extremely efficient when he does have good line play. And last year, he didn't look great because he's playing with Austin Eckler uh, beside him, who's like one of the most efficient backs in the league. But even if it is somewhat of like a timeshare, I think he'll still see like 50 to 60% of the snaps and getting the valuable carries and the valuable work in the receiving game. 
I think that'll be enough for him to be like an RB one for the next two seasons. Yeah, well, yeah. you're gonna have to uh, you're gonna have to battle up again with another running back, Noah, and that is Mr. David Montgomery because you have him at uh, 99. So you're completely off him. Me and me and Mike got him bike to bike at 81, 82. Running backs 24, 21. You got him all the all the way down at running back 29. <laughs> Do you just think like this is they're just gonna let David Montgomery get the volume this year and then he's dust? You think he's just done after this year? I don't think he's like a bad running back, but the situation he's put in is just like awful. It's so bad. The offensive it's line so sucks. Bad. They don't give him any passing work either, despite like he was decent at Iowa State in the receiving game. Like Tariq Cohen is still for some reason being used out of the back. Like he's a good pass catcher, but like when you don't have to tip your hand and you can put David Montgomery out there on third downs, like why not do it? He's still the goal line back there, but the problem for me is like if you're relying on a goal line on a running back getting his value on the goal line but on a team that probably isn't going to be in the red zone or on the five very often, you're looking for like empty volume because it's just like a ton of touches inside, like in between the twenties. Uh, he is still very young and he might get that second contract or get traded to like a better situation. But like Chicago has done nothing to like show me that they're trying to build for the future. Like they just bring in Nick Foles. They have Mitchell Trubisky there. Like I just have no faith in this team. And I don't think for the next few years, as long as like this regime is still there and they're still running the plays that they're running, I don't see how he ever finishes like a top 15 running back on the season. Yeah, this offense is going to be so ugly this year. The only thing Montgomery has going for him is is just pure in between the 20s volume. Like he will get the goal line work, but I can't confidently say he's getting more than seven goal line carries this year because I don't know if the Bears are scoring seven fucking touchdowns this year. <laughs> like it's, it's – yeah, it's like he's – as soon as you draft one bear on your team, every other bear needs to be off your board immediately because you can't <laughs> stack two players – on the bears on your team. So, I mean, like I have him higher than you, but like, I'm not, he's not a, I mean, we have him around the eighties and nineties. You're seeing David yeah. Montgomery go off the board typically in like regular dynasty leagues in like the fourth round, fourth, fifth round, you know? So yeah. it seems like all of us are off of him. No, you just seem to be a little bit, a little bit more off of him. Yeah. I mean, we're, look, we're all off of him. Like at, at this rate, like he's mostly going in like the sixth round at the latest, maybe seventh round um, on the super late end, but I usually see him go in the fifth or sixth. So at that price, I'm kind of out. No, it's like you said, like for running backs, like I value situation like more than more than anything. And like the only thing the Bears did this offseason was draft Cole Komet. So I'm not sure Cole Komet's they're gonna solve all their offensive line problems. And you know, we talked about efficiency uh from Melvin Gordon and stuff like that. I don't even think efficiency is in his vocabulary for David Montgomery. Um like it's, it's really of, not even in his range of outcomes, which yeah. is like <laughs> fucked up for running back. Yeah. Like, you, you ever see the picture of him on like college game day? It's like the footwork of Saquon yeah, Barkley, yeah, the athleticism yeah. of this. His, like, his range no, of outcomes not at all. Three point five yards a carry to three point nine at the very yeah. best this year. It's gonna yeah, be and look, I I get it. Like I, there's like physical therapists online, like on Twitter, like tweeting videos about Dave Montgomery's footwork. But I saw those same <laughs> videos last last year uh, oh. about him like dancing in between squares, and honestly, it didn't do much for him. And it's not his fault. I don't think he's a bad player. I just think that his style does not lend itself very well to the Chicago Bears. Like if he was on, you know, a team with a good, a good offense, a good pass blocking, a good zone blocking um, offensive line, like I'd be way more into him because I think he does have good vision. I think he has some good balances, but it, given the, given where the Chicago Bears are, it's just not, not a great investment to have. They're, they're too far your, away. They're too far yeah. away to make Montgomery into like a really good fantasy back within the near future. Yeah, that, exactly. That's the problem with it. Yeah. By the time that the Bears have like fully rebuilt it, which I don't even know how they'll do because Ryan Pace totally managed that shit into the ground. Like they don't have enough future assets to do it. Uh, but by the time he does, like he'll, you'll be talking about him in the cell window. So it's not a great place to be. Um, definitely not someone I'm targeting. Someone I have some minimal exposure to here and there, but, but not someone that I'm too excited about for 2020 or, or beyond. Yeah. Uh, next up, I'm excited. I'm excited about this guy. Okay. Because I'm, I'm going to defend him to my dying breath to all of you blasphemous people who dare rank OBJ outside of the top 12. But it's Odell Beckham Jr. Nick, you got him at 44. Noah, you got him back-to-back -back at 45. I got him all the way up at 29. Uh, BDG composite, 41. You guys got him at wide receiver, 14 and 13, respectively. I still have him as a top 10 wide receiver. You know, that uh, it's wild to me to think that that's a hot take now, but that is what, it is what it is. I'll let you guys shit on him first, and then uh, I'll, I'll come to the streets to clean up. 
I think he's just like scary to own. I mean, Mr. everything God. we've seen out of him like the past four years, it's like either injured or like a new situation or like Eli Manning sucked and then Baker Mayfield wasn't like a great fit for him this past season. And he's low-key getting up there. I think he's like 27 years old. He might be 28. I'm not going to say that because then people are going to like rail me in the comments for saying he's 28. 27.7, according to player profile. All right, so he's like 35. So like, <laughs> like he's just a guy that I'm kind of nervous about because like he has a history of foot injuries. And I do think like this year, if that offense is what we expect it to be and like be better than what Freddie Kitchens was running last season, like he did get a ton of volume. But then like there's that question mark of are they going to be extremely run heavy? But then they like bring in Austin Hooper, so you don't expect extremely run heavy. It's just like there's a ton of question marks. The least questionable thing about him is like his talent. He is one of the most talented wide receivers in the NFL. But kind of like Dave Montgomery, it's just like wide receivers don't matter as much situation based. But like we've seen in the past that the situation has a big impact on how Odell produces. And last year he was like a volume play, and he wasn't really producing despite getting like 130 targets on the season. So for me, it's a little bit of like his age combined with. The fact that I think a lot of fantasy players are starting to lose hope in Odell, and if he does have another down season, I don't see where his like I don't see his value increasing at all. Like obviously, if he has a down season, it's going to decrease, but like I think it's going to be tough for his value to increase from where it is right now. Yeah, it's just like it feels like it's three straight seasons of unlucky breaks, but like at some point, you know, I, that is definitely factored into it now. There's probably because he was a top five pick for so long because the first three seasons in the league, he's over 1,300, 1,300 receiving yards. Last three seasons, he hasn't topped 1,100 in any of them. Some of them are circumstantial. Some of them are injuries, whatever it is. Uh, I was listening to a podcast with Matt Harmon. He went on to the PFF podcast uh, with Ian Harditz, and they were talking about his outlook on reception perception. And, you know, he was basically saying Odell's been elite when it comes to reception perception since he's stepped foot on the field in the NFL, 99th percentile against press coverage, against man coverage. Last year was a, a monster dip off. And Matt Harmon was like, yeah, like I'm very willing to say that it was completely riding on that sports hernia surgery or whatever injury he was dealing with last year because he had never seen a dip off so dramatically when a player does that. So that has me thinking that like maybe last year, you know, he played the full 16 and that's what we've been waiting for. We want to see him operate as the number one and we finally got to see it and then he didn't do shit with it. So I will say there are, there's, it just seems like we're waiting for all of these things to go right for him. Like I don't think there's going to be the volume in the passing game because the Vance is coming over. They're going to be very, very run heavy. I don't think he, he tops the number of targets that he had last year. Like I think 130 is probably almost like hopeful for what we want to see out of Odell. Uh, I do think the passing game will be a lot more efficient. They're going to bring over a lot more play action passes. They're going to have a better offensive line, giving Baker more time back there. But I, I just feel like the window is kind of closing on Odell and we're not, we're never going to have that like confluence of perfect storm um that we've been waiting for like julio jones to have right like we've been waiting for that to happen with odell i i just think the clock is kind of ticking here so odell between the injuries between the weird chemistry between himself and and baker and run heavy stefanski coming in i just i don't know i'm just i i don't know if i see the ceiling there yeah uh look those are all definitely valid concerns and for me like for wide receivers, I'm always willing to bet more on talent. And last year, I was a little bit hesitant on Od Odell just because he was switching teams. Mm -hmm. So whenever a wide receiver switched teams, I'm like red flags go off for me immediately. Um, so, but usually what you see, and, and I think Addison Hayes did like a pretty good study on this in year two is like when they get that next bump. Yeah. Um, you kind of saw it a little bit with Jarvis Landry as well. Um, but yeah, like you said, it's a sports hernia. Like, I think that is a big freaking deal, man. Like, it's like he played the full 16 games, sure. But like, there's no way he was like even close, like 100%, 80% of what he, what he was or what he should be. And this is like, you know, he got the off season surgery. You're hoping that he's healthy. And like, here's the thing, right? Like people think that, you know, it seems like it's so long ago that Odell was like really good, right? It seems like forever ago, but in 2018, like, do you know what he was on a points per game basis? It's very, um, very good. He was wide receiver eight. He was scoring like 19.2 points per game. So like, those are the types of guys where you really want the wide receiver position. Like the total, Total ranking for wide receivers, like even all players in general is nice, but like I'm really looking for points per game because like those are the guys that win you the weeks um, because like, you know, if they don't play, like you don't start a zero in that slot unless they get literally get injured in that game. Um, so I still see that upside. Like, and I would not be shocked at all if like Odell Beckham like shocks everyone and becomes like a top three wide receiver this year because that's the talent that he has. And I'm also the other thing is I'm not also out on Baker. So I think, you know, some people are pretty, pretty much all off Baker. Uh, I'm not. It's just like, there's so many things that went wrong from last year. It's like wrong team, 
sports or knee surgery, Freddie Kitchens, literally the worst offensive play caller I've ever seen. Like some of the videos that wow. I'm seeing, like go back wow. and cut. Up. We're, we're <laughs> like literally living through the Bill O'Brien era. <laughs> yeah. No, way, that's true. <laughs> going, going, no, no, seriously. Like I, I, I was watching like some of the, some of the plays are being called and like he would literally call in plays where like wide receivers are running into each other. It'd be like, you know, third and short would be like three, like four vertical and all of them are crossing the same side of the field on the short side. So I, I have a lot of hope uh, for what Stefanski will do for that offense as a whole. And it might be run heavy for sure. But at the end of the day, I'm still betting on Odell to like basically eat and be a target hog. Like I wouldn't be surprised at all if he came out and if he played a full 16 games, get 150 targets and like go back to his 1300 yards and, you know, double digit TDs. Like that was another area where he really struggled last year which is weird, right? Because Odell has always been dominant in the red zone. Like the guy, nobody like gets jump balls and like beats one-on-one press coverage like Odell. So it's a lot of things that I'm that I'm definitely like, you know, projecting onto it. But I do think that like the talent is like too much to to ignore. Um, but if you do want to fade him because injury risk, I have no rebuttal against that. Like, because he's, he's shown that he's fragile and he's definitely, you know, hasn't been healthy uh, throughout his entire career. So, but I'm just assuming that he can be healthy. Uh, for the first time and if he is healthy i think a top three finish is well within reason yeah that's the the other thing that a little concerns me a little bit is just like the context behind the injuries like it's also possible that while the sports hernia surgery slowed him down last year he's had a lot of serious injuries over the last few years like the shattered ankle the sports hernia surgery with his long rehab behind it it's possible that those injuries have have made him into a different player like he's not you know you talk about like the fast twitch fibers like if he's not hitting that like elite fast twitch ceiling that he had, he's not the Odell Beckham that we've been kind of accustomed to to knowing. So I am I, I'm definitely factoring the injury in there like pretty uh, pretty wholeheartedly because I think they've been pretty fucking serious. It's not like he's you know spraining ankles here and pulling hamstrings here. They're like really significant shit. Yeah, for sure. Uh, next up, I'm I was floored when I saw this the blatant disrespect by Nick. But let's just let me just read out these numbers for you. Gang, it's Keenan Keenan Allen, who's been one of the only guys who's finished as a wide receiver one for the past three consecutive seasons. So let's just put that out there. But first of all, Nick's got him at 75th overall. Noah's got him at 48. I got him at 51 and closely behind for a comps to score at 58 overall. Nick's got him at wide receiver 29. There are, you, think, you think there are 28 wide receivers in the league you'd rather have than Keenan Allen? I need that's, to that's what that number means. Yeah. I, 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 need to, I need to understand why. Okay, Noah's got him at 15. I got him at 18. Uh, which, you know, when I looked at it, I was like, oh, I feel like I'm a little bit too low, but that's just the function of the wide receiver bracket being so high there in terms of that big ass tier. But Nick, like, can you please explain to me why you think Keenan Allen is going to be wide receiver 29? Because by the time, either one of two things, by the time he has, there's a 50 50 chance that he doesn't have a serviceable quarterback until the time he's 31 or 32 years old. That is my biggest concern. And even if you're like, okay, Tyrod's serviceable, Justin Herbert will be serviceable. Neither of them are getting any sort of passing volume in this. Like the, the Chargers, even if like Tyrod's okay for them, the, the, the Chargers are not giving Tyrod like 550 pass attempts. They're not going to be leaning on Tyrod to lead that team. So my concern comes in where like Keenan is, a, is, is pretty much a volume guy as a slot receiver. And the chemistry he had with Phillip Rivers, even though Phillip Rivers was fucking diminished by the, by the time he left uh, – the chargers like i don't know if a quarterback comes in and immediately starts to target keenan the way that uh the way that philip rivers did so this is more of like factoring age into uh just the uncertainty of quarterbacks here man like i'm not questioning keenan's talent like he's obviously the best route runner in the nfl if not you know top three whatever i just like i don't know i i, I just think he's going to be someone that yeah he'll probably be a good floor play for the next couple of years but it might turn into like 75 for a thousand and six touchdowns and i'm just like i'd rather take uh, a young player that's 22 years old that i think can be someone that has more upside you know like mm -hmm. that that's really the way i'm looking at it. it's not like i don't like keenan or anything but i just don't I, the, the quarterback plays it could be a fucking terrible question mark for three years mm -hmm. hold up just just hold on one, one sec i just want to point out one thing here so we're definitely worried about the pass volume i agree with you totally worried about the pass volume as well but in a reduced pass volume even if he's like 500 something passes like to me, like Keenan Allen is the guy, right? It doesn't matter who's at the quarterback. Like if anything, he, his, his play style, where he plays from out of the slot, the way he gets open, the way he runs routes, the way he beats press, the way he beats literally everyone is, is going to be like that guy that a bad quarterback leans on. And if we look at like 2018, for example, Phillip Rivers only passed for 508 attempts, right? And in that year, Keenan Allen finished as a wide receiver 12. So, and like you said, Rivers was a little bit diminished version of himself. So I, I think, yeah, like the concerns are valid. Like I'm worried too. But at the end of the day, like 
when I when I think about lower pass volume, same similar to OBJ, I think it hits the other guys more. So I'd be worried more worried about Mike Williams. I'd be more worried about Hunter Henry. But I think like at the end of the day, like Keenan Allen is just gonna eat no matter what. Yeah, and I am kind of worried about the quarterback play too. And like most of my takes on Keenan Allen are gonna be biased. But as Mike said, like. Other than Austin Eckler, there isn't much of an easier completion to make in that offense than Keenan Allen. So even if they throw it like 450, 500 times, I still think with Keenan Allen getting like a 25% target share, I don't know the math off the top of my head. Uh, what's that, like 125? That's com- probably completely wrong. But I just don't see a situation where he's not even like not close to like blowing everybody out of the water in terms of like target volume overall. And if we look at like what rookie quarterbacks have done in the past in their first year, like this past season, Daniel Jones peppered Golden Tate a lot. Like he missed four games. He still led the team in targets. Larry Fitzgerald was still eating out of the slot in Arizona. Uh, in his rookie year, Baker Mayfield basically just force fed Jarvis Landry into a wide receiver one role because, you know, when you're a big slot type of guy like that, when you're not matching up against the best corners in the league and, you know, you get open because Keenan Allen is a very good route runner. I think that even on a limited overall volume play in Los Angeles, which certainly may happen, I still think he'll be by far and away be the wide receiver one on this team. And out of like pure volume, even less than what he's seen in the past, he'll be able to produce because he is still a huge part of their red zone offense. I think I'm not sure about last season, but I know the two previous seasons, he combined for like 39 red zone targets, which was like second in the league, which was pretty surprising because you don't think of him as like a jump ball guy. But then again, you don't have to be a jump ball guy to be good in the red zone. Like he just gets open at will because he's so quick off the line. So I do have him pretty high at wide receiver 15. And not that I'm saying to move Michael Thomas down your rankings and not to like bring up the age as I always do, but like they're one year apart and New Orleans is also like one to two years away from trying to find a quarterback themselves. And it might be Jameis Winston because they brought him in this year, but like what's to say that Jameis Winston, they don't think that he's the long-term option and they go through a quarterback disparity like they're doing in uh, Los Angeles right now and they can't find the guy and like Taysom Hill is the guy for some reason it's like okay you're an get age out, get out of here with this fucking party. get out of here with this art there's nah, no nah. quarterback that's throwing for 4,000 yards this year Tyrod ain't eclipsing 4,000 yards you can give me you can give me younger wide receiver over a 125 target 28 year old wide receiver how many times are they going to be in the red zone this year like, I, I I ever I drive LA is going to be a, a, a bad fucking offense you're not going to have fun watching them this year Noah it's going to be I never a, have fun watching them. That's the, yeah. that's like the problem with my family. <laughs> right. You're never going to have, I just think we're going to get more like fucking six for 60 games out of Keenan than anything else. And like, that's cool. But I think eventually that plays itself out. And uh, I don't know, fuck the, the quarterback situation is too fucked over there for me. Like the ranking, I understand I'm probably too low on him, but that's just my way of saying like, I'm not drafting Keenan Allen, you know? It's fair to have him there too. It's not like we're saying you're wrong. It's like you should have concerns about this quarterback situation. And obviously different people are going to feel like a different way about it. I'm, I'm a little bit more confident in Justin Herbert for unknown reasons. And Nick is probably more rational and being uh, very hands-off in that situation. So uh, I, I like where Keenan Allen's at for me after this season. It might be a whole different story. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. Uh, I'm, I'm so betting on him though. Uh, right. Next up. Who else am I uh, disrespecting on this list? Let's yeah, go. I can't believe you're disrespecting him but you're kind of like disrespecting him but you're not because you rent him 88 we know that's an elite number for wide receivers but it's tyler boyd nick has him at 88th overall noah's got him at 75 i'm leading the pack with 66 uh for an overall composite of 76 nick's got him at wide receiver 33 just straight up disrespectful both Noah and i have him at 25 for 26 overall composite ranking because obviously nick does not matter that's how that ranking works uh nick uh, actually i'm I'm gonna i'm gonna speak on this first before i let you speak because i don't even know what you're gonna say about it but Tyler Boyd at Tyler Boyd at wide receiver 33 feels a little bit too low for me just because like I don't know if I'm taking all the rookies ahead of him. Um, like he's he's someone where like he's basically produced as expected uh, for someone of his profile. You know he had a very elite profile coming out of college, not athletically, but in terms of his production profile. Uh, super early breakout age, extremely high dominator. He produced at an elite level in college at Pitt um, before coming into the NFL. Uh, he had a little bit of a slow start in his rookie season, but still put up some respectable numbers and then took a massive leap in his third year, which is like on that third year trajectory. And now he's put up back to back thousand yard rush, a uh, thousand yard receiving seasons. Uh, he's not going to be a weapon in the red zone, obviously, but you know, he did it with AJ green. He did it without AJ green. Uh, so, you know, he's gonna be part of that offense. And now we know Joe Burrow's going there. We've seen what Joe Burrow did with Justin Jefferson. Uh, so I have a lot of hope for, for Tyler Boyd, just in terms of what he is. He's still incredibly young. I think he's 26 years old right now. So uh, just about to hit that peak. Uh, we know AJ green's coming back. So I have some hope for this offense as a whole going, going forward, but like outside of like, maybe I, I think I would take lamb over him. Um, 
but like beyond that, I'm like, I'm like really, really struggling now to think of like a rookie wide receiver. I took over Boyd. And I think he's just that great, a great wide receiver two piece to build around. He's someone, you know, similar to what I said about DJ Moore. Like he's not going to be a, he doesn't have that top five overall upside. I don't think, uh, but he could very well be a younger Robert Woods. And that's exactly what I think about him when I, when I think about him. So I'm looking at my rankings and I have him 33, but the guys I have in front of, like I have Rager, I have Judy and I have, I actually have rugs in front of him. Shout out to K liquid TV on, on Twitter. Who's this Madden guy who does YouTube videos. And he showed me how to update my rosters. Finally, after like six months of trying drafted Henry rugs in a fucking fantasy draft. The guy is elite in Madden. And I think that might've, <laughs> that might've toyed with my rankings to be honest with you. You're so good that I'm getting higher on rugs, but on a serious note, I'm looking at my rankings and I could, I could easily, there's just like a tier of those seven guys in front of them that I could easily put Boyd at the wide receiver 26 or 27 and feel completely fine. So I don't feel strongly with him down there. I think this was one of those like, uh, you know, serendipitous moments where it just happened to be in the time of me doing the rankings. I was just like, ah, I'm just going to move him down here, down here. And before you know, he was 33, but I, I don't feel like strongly about him going down there. I do like Boyd a lot. It's definitely not a shot at Boyd. I think there's a good probability that he just goes off for a thousand yards for the next like three or four seasons in a row with Joe Burrow. And I think there's probably a ceiling of like, to, he could just continue to be the wide receiver to own in Cincinnati for the next three or yeah. four years and, and slowly put up like 1100 yards, 1200 yards. So I definitely like Boyd. I think there was just like a little bit of a, a tier, a, a tier there for me where I just a, wrong day, wrong time. Fucking Boyd got his head chopped off there. That's what <laughs> happened here. Yeah, I think we talked about him last week, too. And Mike just, like, hit every nail on the head. Like, he's young. He's productive. He had a good profile. He has a new quarterback coming in. We think the offensive line is going to be good in the future. Like, I don't know. He's just somebody I like to own in all my drafts. And he's somebody that, like, consistently in the eighth round is just going off the board. Like, him, Robert Woods, and Devontae Parker, if you just do the Scott method and you trade out of every early round pick and you get three eighths and you fade the wide receiver position, just draft those three and you're going to be very happy for like the next two to three years. You just never feel bad when you take Tyler Boyd, like redraft. Yeah, you don't feel Dynasty. good, but you don't feel bad. Yeah, yeah. exactly. It's just like yeah. a guy that you're like, you're happy to have on your team. Cause you, he's just been 24 years old for the last five years and he'll be 24 <laughs> for the next five years. You're just like, okay, he'll be a piece for my team for a while. Yeah. So I'm sorry, man, Mr. Mr. Boyd. No, just man had man. 148 targets last year. When I saw that, I was like, holy shit. Like, that's way more than I thought. Obviously, a lot of those targets were horrible, horrible quality targets, uh, especially when they benched Andy Dalton. But I think with Bro, Bro coming in, you have something to be excited about between him, my boy Teddy Higgins, AJ Green saying he's going to sign a franchise tag. Uh, lots to be excited about in that offense, I think. Um, but yeah, let's wrap it up here. We're going to wrap it up with the tight end position because nobody cares about that position. Uh, but it does matter, contrary to popular belief. But we got Tyler Higby, one of the most, I would say, polarizing players of the offseason, just in terms of what he did. I mean, there's no denying what he did, right? He put up a five-game stretch, which is arguably one of the greatest five-game stretches of any tight end in, in history. You know, there's a lot of reasons why he did that. You know, some say it's because he went up against bottom-tier tight end defenses, you know, uh, tight end funnel defenses like Cardinals and the Dallas Cowboys, uh, who he played twice. Uh, but at the same time, it's like, he put up a historic five game sample and we kind of saw a shift in the offensive methodology of the Rams uh, towards the second half uh, with his involvement. Um, and I, I just think like, it's really hard to ignore that, but you know, Nick's got him down at 126. So basically never drafting this guy. Uh, Noah's got him at 83. I got him at 90 uh, BDG overall composite of 100. Nick's got him at tight end 15. What Noah's got him at where eight, do you guys nine, have him tight end? Sorry. So you have the tight end 15, tight end 15. Who do you guys have like right behind him? Like which younger guy? Like you have Jonu Smith behind him. You have Goddard behind him. You have, yeah. You have Hawkinson. You have Hawkinson in front of him. I'm assuming. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Hawkinson is ahead of him. I think I do. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. I mean, listen for Higby, it's like, I'm just not willing to bet on a, a five game sample size after being in the league for four years. And I know that tight ends break out late but I think something that's kind of being swept under the rug too and it could be that Higby just straight up stole it from Everett but Everett was out for the majority of those games that Tyler Higby uh, put up those numbers so who knows what it you know might have looked like if Everett was actually on the field for that the other thing I think that needs to be discussed is like this Rams offense could like nosedive pretty fucking hard like maybe not this year but like within the next year or two this just could be an offense that you don't really want pieces of like we don't know what Jared Goff is going to turn into because he's had stretches where he looked fucking miserable he's had stretches where he looks great and he could put up statistics but like I don't know if this is an offense that I necessarily want to invest in for the long term because their best days are certainly behind them if they can keep afloat and keep a couple fantasy assets in there that are 
playing well than like maybe Higby, but I'm just, I usually tend to bet against small sample sizes and I'd rather someone um, with a little more upside who's not, what is he like 27, 28 years old? Like, I just think that the younger dudes that are going behind him, like the Jonu Smiths and the more athletic guys, I would rather have, uh, rather have in, instead of Higby, just, I don't know, this, this, the sample size is just not, not enticing enough for me knowing that Everett wasn't on the field for those. Yeah, I, yeah, I think me, I definitely have a lot more. I think I have a lot more confidence in him than Nick does because, like, Everett wasn't on the field, but Everett is also like 26 years old and he's had only a handful of good games as well. And the fact that Tyler Higby, again, Mike said it was against poor pass defenses, but the fact that he did it like week after week after week and the offense kind of it, it flipped to fit around the run game a little bit, but that also in turn helped out Tyler Higby. And the fact that they haven't made any improvements to the offensive line, like they drafted a 45 year old wide receiver and a running back in the second round. It just leads me to believe that they're probably going to keep up with these two tight end sets. He got like a massive contract extension or like a new deal. He signed through 2023 Everett is a free agent after this year and they might bring him back, but they also drafted Bryson Hopkins. So for me personally, I think that Tyler Higby is going to be their tight end of the future. And like, Sure, he's not athletic, but he was also not athletic when he was going for 100 yards and two touchdowns every week towards the end of the season. So I do have concerns about this offense as a whole, but I, I do have faith that Tyler Higby is the answer for them in the future just because, like, how dominant he was towards the end of the last season. Yeah, I mean, the for me, like, tight ends, I, I really like to look at their efficiency metrics. And, you know, it's honestly, like, it's more recently. Like, if you look at tight ends in the past, like, if you look at their res yards per route run, you don't see as many in the top 10. So Tyler Higby actually ranks seventh overall in the league, not just out of tight ends, but out of every single receiver, uh, including like running back. So George Kittle was number one. Mark Andrews was number two. God. Uh, and then you had Tyler Higby at number seven, Darren Waller at number 10. So you had four tight ends in the top, in the top 10. So I don't know if that's a, that's a league shift thing. People are just, you know, realizing that the mismatch that tight ends offer is, is a lot better, but to, to like be that efficient, uh, and it was over his entire like target sample. So he had 86 targets, 69 receptions, 734 yards for 2.6 yards per route run, like just behind AJ Brown. So to me, I think when you show efficiency as a receiver, it typically leads to more volume and they had a ton of success with him. So like, it's a small sample size, but like, to me, like not all sample sizes are created equal, right? Like if I can, if I can construct a rational like thought in terms of like, does that sample size represent what's going forward? It, I can actually buy into. And I think in this case I can versus like someone like McCall Hardman. We talked about him last week. Like when you analyze his sample size, like it was like random games towards the beginning of the season. So like there really wasn't a trend to like pull out from that. Whereas here, I think there is. And obviously there's a lot of risk still. Like, like you said, he's not athletic. You know, Gerald Lever, it was there. Uh, what was injured. Um, but like when you, even when you compare, like when Gerald Everett was healthy, like his efficiency numbers didn't come close to what Higby was doing. So to me, it comes down to efficiency. It comes down to production. It comes down to the fact that I can kind of like project that going forward. Uh, but obviously there's still a lot of risk there. Yeah. I mean, the signs are there. If he does end up like playing really well this year, it's, I'm just going to be like, I'm a fucking idiot. Like we knew who he was at the end of last year, but I'm, I think I'm okay missing the boat on a guy like that for someone who I think has maybe more upside, maybe not yeah. more bust potential, but um yeah i don't know i don't feel strongly about higby all right well that wraps it up uh for this week uh the rankings updates you know you you heard a lot of opinions and you know at bdg we don't always agree on shit i think that's that's healthy you know we have some healthy debates like this and we see. don't always agree but i'm always right <laughs> <laughs> yeah except when you're not which is all the time but uh yeah aside from that you know i think hopefully you guys found this helpful uh, we're going to be coming at you with more videos throughout the week. You know, Noah's dropping dick facts every Friday, dropping us some humorous shit on Saturdays. I'm going to be launching a segment called Market Watch Mondays where I kind of track some stock. And obviously, a little hard to do this year because, like, there isn't much news. But, you know, I'll try and cover, you know, what I think about, you know, player movements and value if there are movements and then whether I think that's warranted. So that's going to be a segment that's coming out soon as well. But make sure you subscribe. Make sure you cop the draft guide for redraft for dynasty. Make sure you become a Patreon, join our Discord, you know, join up all the leagues that Noah's hosting uh, throughout the time and become part of the ADP, man. Become part of the family, become part of the BG family. Promise you, you will not regret it. It will be worth every goddamn penny that you spend. Damn, my mic wasn't on a stand right now. I dropped the shit out of it. That was a good, that was a good outro though, Mike. All right, yeah, that's all we got for this week. Uh, make sure you are subscribed to the Bunk Bed Breakdowns YouTube channel as well. We'll see y'all next Wednesday.